we had a peaceful transition of presidents. <laughs> Jeff Niddle turned over the reins to Dave McKay. And because of that, our friends at Embry-Riddle would like to make a presentation uh, before we start the formal part of the meeting. And I want to introduce Dan Montpleasure, uh, the Vice President of Advancement for Embry-Riddle. Dan. Appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon. The Wings Club and Emma Riddle have uh, many accomplishments and people in common. And uh, two uh, examples are board members who serve on the Board of Trustees at Emory Riddle and also on the board at the Wings Club, uh, Jean Rosenvallon at Desso Falcon, and uh, one of the new board members for the Wings Club, Zane Rowe, who's the CFO at Continental United. And uh, in addition, each organization has played an important role in the development of aviation and the aerospace industry. Our pilots, meteorologists, aerospace engineers are passionate uh, as a career field and also that aviation is a part of who they are. And increasingly, our alums are playing a role in the areas of insurance and financial management, including here in uh, New York. So today we celebrate a very special connection between the Wings Club and Emory Riddle as we recognize two of our outstanding graduates, Jeff Niddle and David McKay. Each has excelled in their own career, displaying leadership, professionalism, a commitment to the next generation of young aviators and especially to Emory Riddle students. And I've had the pleasure of getting to know both of these gentlemen personally as they're involved and engaged with the university and through the Wings Club. The truly passionate, smart individuals that lead by example, and with busy schedules, with hundreds of commitments, they make it a priority to provide leadership at the Wings Club and within Embry-Riddle. So on this occasion of the passing of the gavel between two Embry-Riddle graduates, we thought it appropriate to use this afternoon to recognize them with the Embry-Riddle Eagle of Excellence Award, our highest alumni award recognizing professional achievement and industry leadership. So presenting the award with me today is Michelle Berg, our Director of Alumni Relations. And uh, we're very proud that this May will graduate our 100,000th graduate of Embry-Riddle Campus uh, out of all of our campuses. And so uh, first I'd like to invite up uh, Jeff Nettle, please. Just briefly, Jeff is a 1980 graduate of the Daytona Beach campus of Embry-Riddle. He earned his bachelor's degree in aviation management. He serves on the president's advisory board at the university. And as he has distinguished himself as president of CIT Transportation Finance and for his service as president of the Wings Club, uh, we congratulate him and join me in congratulating again, Jeff. Just, just a brief, uh, a few brief remarks. As many, many of you who know me know how important uh, education is uh, to me and how important aviation is to me. And the combination of those two things, specifically what Embry-Riddle does today and aviation itself is just an amazing, uh, an amazing combination. First of all, thank you for, for the, uh, uh, for the award and, and certainly uh, you, the better half is, is soon to come. But when I look at the graduates today of Embry-Riddle, it is truly amazing. Uh, when I went to the school, and, and Dave, I think you would comment the same, it was a very small school. There were less than a thousand people. Now it's thousands of students, the highest quality, I believe the top aeronautical engineering program in the world today. And all I can say is, for, to the students, it's a great opportunity. You're lucky to go to a wonderful school. And I'm just proud to have been um, a graduate of Embry-Riddle. Thank you very much. David, if you'll join us. David is a 1977 graduate of the Daytona Beach campus. He earned a, a bachelor's degree in aeronautical uh, sciences and serves on the industry advisory board at both residential campuses. Through his hard work and dedication, David has ridden through, risen through the ranks at U.S. Aviation Underwriters to become president of the company, and now as his incoming role as president of the Wings Club. Please join me in congratulating David McKay. Well, Dan and Michelle, thank you very much, and please thank Dr. Johnson and the board of Embry-Riddle. Um, clearly, and just to comment, uh, to, to punctuate uh, Jeff's comments, there's 
there's nothing more critical to our industry than the development of our leaders. So I think Embry-Riddle, and I'm also very proud to see Dowling College and the Aviation High School here as well, and to see the next generation of leaders. But very proud to, to be an alum and the job that Embry-Riddle continues to do. Thank you very much. If I could, um, as, as Harris pointed out, last night was the annual meeting. And on that occasion is the opportunity for transition from one president to the next. This club has been very, very lucky to be graced with some terrific leaders through the past, many of which are around the room. When I look at some of the, uh, the leaders that this club has had, whether it be um, historical figures or just the greatest aviation leaders, it is just humbling to, to be involved with that group. And I am so proud to be able to hand the gavel to someone who is a truly terrific aviation leader. You've heard from, from Dan about uh, his career. And all I can say is that when you think of aviation, you think about Dave. Dave McKay loves aviation, whether it's his flying around at his Mooney, whether it was his military career, whether it was his time at Embry-Riddle, he is the quintessential aviation professional. And I think we are all very, very lucky to have him as our new leader. So Dave, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Best of luck. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Well, Jeff, thank you so much. You're, as usual, way too kind. <laughs> um, Ladies and gentlemen, we had a wonderful event uh, last night, our annual meeting, and during the course of that meeting, we had the change of command ceremony, which was terrific. We had the opportunity to recognize and honor the U United States Air Force Service Pilots, the WASPs, which was a, just a wonderful event. And I had the opportunity then to, to recognize Jeff's wonderful accomplish accomplishments during his term. And I wanted to do that again uh, for you so you, you, could, you could hear what uh, Jeff has accomplished. You'll read in the Wings Club annual report a remarkable list of, of those accomplishments during Jeff's term. Our monthly speaker roster was uh, un absolutely unparalleled, and last night it was the last five luncheons were a sellout. I get, now get to say, based on Jeff's leadership, the last six are a sellouts. The annual dinner under Jeff's command set new standards for both attendance and revenues, and our financial position as a club, as a result, remains exceptionally strong. So I'd like to recognize and thank Jeff for his wonderful tenure as our president and for his leadership and vision and say, Jeff, you're going to be a tremendously tough act to follow. I'd again like to thank Embry-Riddle, and I just uh, saw some news yesterday that uh, Embry-Riddle continues to make history that the first airstrike uh, in the Libyan uh, UN mandate was led by uh, Major General Margaret Woodward, an Embry-Riddle uh, graduate and commander of the 17th Air Force. So in compare and compast, contrast to what a 70-year difference will make with the WASPs who struggled to serve their country in aviation in World War II to the commanding general being a woman pilot, I think that's pretty fabulous. So I'd like to <laughs> recognize that. Well, we're thrilled today to have with us as our guest speaker, Giovanni Bisignani, who I'll introduce uh, after following our lunch. Uh, but I'd also like to acknowledge, besides uh, Giovanni, our head table. Giovanni Bisignani, the Director General uh, and CEO of IATA, who I will uh, introduce more formally before our lunch. And if you'd please hold your applause until we get through all, that would be a help. Ken Gazzola, our past president and uh, president and CEO of Flight Logics Inc. Carol Hallett, past president of Council of U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Jeff Niddle, immediate past president. President CIT Transportation Finance. Joe Leonard, past president, retired chairman Air Trans Airways. John Slattery, past president, senior vice president Embraer. Gary Spulak, president, 
Embraer Aircraft Holdings, and Greg Thomas, Greg Thomas, President, Private Air, and also President of the Wings Club European Chapter. I'd also like to recognize Bruce Whitman, President and CEO of Flight Safety International. At table two, we have Todd Coleman, President, Commercial Engines, Pratt & Whitney. Ms. Todd. Um, table four, uh, I was going to introduce Dave. Is Dave Barger here? I didn't see him, so I just wanted to recognize him he's here, also a past president. Table six, Marlon Daly, Executive VP, Sales Boeing. Tom Fitzsimmons, CFO, Gamma Aviation. Bill Flynn, President and CEO, Atlas Air Holdings. Jeff Foland, Senior VP, United Airlines. Julius Maldudis, past president, uh, President, Aviation Dynamics, Inc. And Jim Parker, Senior Vice President, FedEx Express. I'd also like to introduce at Table 12, Jim Coyne, who's the president of NATA and a former congressman representing the 8th District of Pennsylvania. Uh, we have, as is tradition at the, uh, at the Wings Club, we have a door prize. I hope you'll put your business card in a bowl that Harris will circulate. I don't see Harris, but I'm sure he's working that. Uh, there he is. Harris will, when he's finished, <laughs> circulate the bowl. So please uh, drop your card in uh, there. Dave Barger has kindly donated two system-wide JetBlue tickets as the door prize today. Uh, we are also very privileged to have uh, two student tables with us today. I think that's fabulous. I mean, our our uh, opportunity to recognize our, our next uh, set of leaders. We have students from the Dowling College who are at table 18. Students, would you please uh, stand and be recognized? And we also have students from the Aviation High School at table 21. Would you please stand and be recognized? Well, thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch, and we'll be back in a bit to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. Giovanni Bisignani is the current Director General and CEO of the International Air Transportation Association, IATA, a position he's held since June of 2002. As head of the IATA, Mr. Bisignani has completely reshaped and refocused the organization to better serve its global membership of 230 airlines. He's introduced a number of industry-changing initiatives, such as the groundbreaking IATA Operational Safety Audit, or IOSA, the first global standard for airline safety management. It's really a remarkable thing. Under his leadership, IATA began the Simplify the Business initiative to bring convenience to travelers and cost reduction to airlines through effective use of technology. His e-ticket initiative to eliminate paper tickets by 2008 and the cargo equivalent, IATA e-freight, modernized the industry. He's also led the discussion on climate change in aviation by uniting the industry in a drive to achieve carbon neutral growth and eventually zero carbon emission technology. Mr. Bisignani was previously the CEO and managing director of Italy's flag carrier Alitalia and has held numerous leadership roles within the travel industry throughout his career. During his tenure as Alitalia CEO, he also served as the chairman of the Association of European Airlines. Mr. Bisignani, a native of Rome, is a graduate of Sapienza University and a graduate of the Harvard Business School. He's also been awarded an honorary Doctorate of Science degree from the Cranfield University School of Engineering. It is my great pleasure to welcome and uh, welcome Giovanni Bisignani back to our podium. Giovanni, please. And it's great to be back in this wonderful city of New York. I love this city. As a young banker, at First National Citibank, I was working a couple of blocks from here in 399 Park Avenue in the 70s, and I used to see the building of Pan Am with the helicopters. How many things have changed during this time. And I appreciate also very much the opportunity and the invitation to address here at the Wings Club for the, first, for the third time, and this is my last time as IATA's Director General and CEO. My successor, Tony Tyler was here and spoke here months ago, and I'm sure that uh, he will be a great guy and a great successor. After nearly 10 years at IATA, I'm looking forward to seeing the industry from another point of view, from the perspective of a board or from teaching. And I'm confident and I'm absolutely convinced that Tony will take IATA to even greater heights. 
But today I would like to speak with you in an honest and transparent way and reflect a bit of what and how the industry has changed in those last 10 years and since the start of this millennium. Just a small parenthesis. I was speaking to this morning to a friend of mine, Leo Mali, who called me a couple of weeks after September 11. At that time, I was working in London, and I had started Opodo, the European orbits. And I remember he told me, Giovanni, the situation is very difficult, September 11, and so on. But the worst is over. It will be a nice and easy ride. And look what happened. Everything from the volcano to the tsunami. So today, we have seen everything. I was mentioning terrorists, war, SARS, other potential pandemics, the price of oil rising, free falling of the economies, the tragedies of the earthquake and the tsunami, and in Europe, the incredible situation of the volcano. And the losses mounted to nearly $50 billion. This has been by far the most challenging decade of the history of aviation. And the industry was not silent. The industry responded with enormous strength to all those changes. Couple of numbers, labor productivity. It's 63% better today than in 1999. Sales and marketing unit cost are down 19%. Fuel efficiency improved by 20%. And IATA also contributed as to those changes, as the chairman illustrated before. This, we saved the industry $55 billion in cash savings since 2004. And these numbers are audited by Deloitte because it's part of the variable compensation of the IATA team. One of the programs that you just mentioned, e-ticketing and simplifying the business program has saved $18 billion. IATA worked also with many partners around the world to shorten the routes. We shortened 2,000 new routes and we spread, spread best practices in fuel management and saved another amount similar of $18 billion. We had to challenge and sometimes I had to shout politely to challenge our monopoly providers to deliver more efficiency, contributing with $19 billion in savings for fuel. Another number. We pay to our service providers, airports and air navigation service provider, $50 billion a year. It's more than 10% of our total operating costs, and unfortunately, many are still operating as a monopolist. We started to fight, we achieved some results. The battle is not over, but we're on top. We have also to keep your money safe. Because IADA is the biggest client of any bank in the world. Yesterday I was in Goldman Sachs, Citibank, and Morgan. I'm received as a king. You know why? <laughs> because in 10 years I handled $2.5 trillion cash. And it's your money, at least the airline's money. And the level of a currency has been 99.99%. And I can tell you, in such a difficult environment, it was not easy. Especially when we have those situations around the world. In 12 hours, we had to change the settlement system from Tokyo to Singapore. We had problems in Egypt. We moved this to, to Amman. From Amman, we moved it in 24 hours to Geneva. So it was not easy, but we managed to have a good track record. But at the same time, as you mentioned before, even more important, we helped the industry improve on safety by 42% since 2001. This is probably the biggest satisfaction that we have had in IATA. In 2010, the global accident rate was one accident per 1.6 million flights. IOTA, IOSA has been a condition for membership since 2001. It looked the difference. The IATA Airlines outperformed the industry average with one accident per four million flights. Unfortunately, this is a great number. And unfortunately, this is the only good number that we have in safety because all the other numbers are terrible. 
because despite this great record on safety and the gains in efficiency, the bottom line is still peanuts. Sometimes I have to ask if we are running a business or a, ch or a charity association. Because last year, one of our best years, $16 billion of profit, but this is 2.9 profit margin. And it will shrink this year to 1.4, hoping that no other events happen. And on $594 billion in revenues, we expect this year, this year to show a net profit of just 8.6 billion. And that was estimating a couple of months ago the assumption of a GDP growth of 3.1% and still an average price of fuel at 96 per barrel. Since then, we have seen many other things that have changed the human tragedy of the great incredible events in, in Japan. And these will also have a strong economic cost that we will see in the following months when we have the final numbers of the months of March. In the events of the Middle East that were more directly affecting and pushed the oil price because the volumes there, Africa represents 1% of the total traffic, so it was the oil that made, that made the difference. And it's going to be another tough year and an uncertain year for our members' airlines. But let's see what is the overall situation in the world, because there's quite a lot of differences between regions. Some regions are financially strong and stronger than others. Europe airlines are by far the weakest. We expect profit of just $500 million. The US is doing better. We expect profit of 3.2 billion. The capacity adjustment during 2008 and the, during the oil price spike saw yields improve, and the cost reduction has been effective. Now the challenge is to renew the fleet, which has an average in the US of 15 years, so compared to the, to the gross world growth of roughly 14 years. But the US are also emerging from the crisis uh, stronger and more competitive. But Latin America, it's a great story. Sometimes not so much stress, because Latin America is the only region in the world to make money for three consecutive years, with a $300 million profit this year. But the biggest star is by far one, is Asia. Asia with uh, more than $3.7 billion in profit. And in Asia, China is the most impressive star. I was telling before to our colleagues at the table that IATA played an important role. When I stepped in in 2002, I knew quite well the Prime Minister, Minister Li Peng, for my previous job, and they awarded us the consultancy program of the Chinese industry. And I can tell you, it has been an incredible, incredible adventure. We presented a plan in consolidation and, and on the rest. We were planning to have this plan executed when we discussed three years. Prime Minister said, why don't you do it in one? They consolidated 36 airlines in six in less than one year. We worked with them with many, many routes. And it's uh, in China, they built 45 new airports since 2006. It plans to spend $230 billion to develop aviation, including 52 more airports by 2020. Last year, they opened 20 airports, each more than $20 million. So when you see that Asia Pacific is not the future, you are still here, many people say it's the future, it's today. Go there and see what happens. Go there see, and see the airport of Beijing. On time, perfect. No hassle, free flight. In 2009, it eclipsed North America as the largest regional market in the world by just a few million passengers. Asia Pacific represents now 26% market share. And this is something. But in 2014, so it's around the corner, 800 million people will fly more, 360 million of those will be in Asia, bringing the market share of Asia Pacific to 
in North America will be in a different position with a market slip to 23%. So it's quite clear that the center of gravity is shifting eastward. And also, if you see what is the assessment of the financial markets, and you see the airline, how do they are ranked by market capital, three of the top five passengers airlines are in China. China Airlines, $18 billion. Singapore Airlines, $13 billion. China, $10 billion. In third place, we see the combined South American, Chile, and Brazil, land time of 12 billion. And only after that, we see those names that are much more familiar to this part of the world. Lufthansa at number five, just under 10 billion. Southwest, over 9 billion, and Delta, 8 billion. So, Asia, uh, Europe, and United States, that for so many leaders were, many years were leaders, are now in a different position. And finding a place in this new world order will be challenging for the traditional leaders of aviation, Europe and United States. The US airlines rebuilt their business over a decade of crisis. Aviation ties the US together, connects it to the world, supports 11 million US jobs and drives 1.2 trillion in US economic activities. But this is not very much appreciated by government or Congress. But aviation does not rank, even rank among the 20 White House strategic partners or priorities. And to be very blunt, there is no long-term vision. Instead, the U.S. aviation policy agenda is dominated by a short-sighted half measures that are more focused on micromanaging the business. Let's look at the policy agenda. Next-gen air traffic management, the FAA reauthorization bill, the proposed passenger right legislation, liberalization and security. When I started 10 years in IATA, I was briefed with the great results of implementing quickly U.S. Next Gen. By 2018, Next Gen should reduce delays by 35%, save 1.4 billion gallons of fuel, and cut 14 million tons of CO2. All great numbers and facts. And this will help the industry to deliver on its commitment to improve the fuel efficiency, as you know, the industry target 1.5 annually to 2020. Net carbon emission by 2020 was carbon neutral growth and cut emission by half compared to 2005. Next gen would be a million times more effective than the European illegal proposal for an emission trading scheme. And I'm pleased to see that the U.S. is opposing, and I encourage that opposition to be more vocal. You have to have more courage. I cannot go to Europe and say United States is against it. And I was with uh, Secretary LaHood on Monday and with uh, the Chairman Mike, and I said, you have to be very clear and send a clear message to, the, to Europe. How can you imagine that a flight, a plane that flies from Chicago overflies the Atlantic and lands in Brussels, will have to say, pay to Brussels an emission trading scheme amount. It makes no sense and it's illegal. But I would like to see United States standing up. Now there's a problem, who's writing the letter? State Department, Department of Trump, write it all together. Sign it together, make a petition, but do something quickly. So, but at the same time, next gen needs to happen. The FAA reauthorization bill, which funds next gen, lapsed in 2007. I think so. I had yesterday, or day before yesterday, its 18th extension. As an observer, but an observer that loves your country. And so it's a bit passionate about this, because I feel part of this great country. As an observer, it is difficult to imagine how such an important program 
to improve competitiveness could be tied up in politics. Earlier this week, I had a meeting with Congressman Micah that I know since many, many years, who assured me that the new bill will be better than the 2010 version and it will be passed quickly. I hope so, and we're looking forward. This is moving very slow. So the slow pace of the FAA reauthorization stands in stark contrast to the quick progress on passengers' rights legislation. President Obama recently announced, announced his vision for government regulation, which is to promote economic growth, reduce uncertainty, and stand up against a cost-benefit analysis. Secretary Lahoud is planning a final version of the June 2010 DO2 rules on passenger protection as early as next month, and the draft must improve strongly. Let's remember that most people arrive at their destination without incident. And when things go wrong, being a hyper-competitive industry provides every incentive to treat the passenger well, to just change. Fines, no matter how large they are, will not melt the snow, stop thunderstorms, free airport gates, build new infrastructure, or deliver more custom personnel. And it will be money wasted, and sometimes it could be also counterproductive results could bring. Why? The 200% compensation for every overbooking may stop the practice that, that may stop the practice that inconveniences of one out of 10,000 passengers. But the resulting what will be a lot of empty seats. The results of empty seats will increase the cost for all the passengers. Airlines want to provide good service, and they are eager to work with DOT in order to improve reliability. But the DOT proposal will not do that, nor will it promote economic growth, reduce uncertainty, or pass a cost-benefit analysis. So it needs serious and strong redrafting. On another subject very important is liberalization. The U.S. approach to liberalization shows how easy it is to get lost in the weeds. The U.S. has played an enormous role. The U.S. fathered some of the modern aviation greatest idea. Fred Kant deregulation changed the face of aviation everywhere. It was a role model. And I congratulate also the U.S. for achieving yesterday 100 open sky agreement formalizing yesterday with a, a signature in Washington with the government of Colombia. The next logical step is to liberalize ownership restrictions. A couple of years ago, the U.S.-U agreement on open sky was our greatest opportunity to throw off four decades of one point percent of profitability. This is the profitability of an industry in 60 years. And that's the reason why I'm quite right in saying that this is a charity association. And let's start to be able to run this as a normal business. U.S. opposition to opening up investment made it a missed opportunity. And at that time, look, it was quite easy. I remember I was there, I was trying to contribute to the negotiations. Secretary Peters was there. There was a discussion, the Delta big merger, and it was a great opportunity because I was trying to explain. First of all, I tried to help. I tried to help negotiating a bit. It's not my role, but here we are among, among friends. Behind the scene, you had to try to put together Europe and United States. And in Europe, three, three points are essential for an open sky. Cabotage, ownership, and market access. At that moment, the issue of cabotage was very, very sensitive in the States because of trade union and so on. And so after a couple of months, I tried to convince our European members, let's give up on cabotage. Who's going to fly cabotage in the States with the yield so low and with the fact that you have agreements in your alliances? So we took away cabotage. I went on discussing with Secretary Peters, a very pleasant lady, 
there, and we were nearly there. After the certain point, some leaks on this kind of thing came out, and uh, a chairman of an important commission in the Congress said no, and so it was a great missed opportunity. Because national ownership restriction is a slow-growing mature market and not a protection. The industry opportunities are not here. The industry opportunity future are in Asia, in Latin America, and elsewhere. The global village that Ireland helped to create has facilitated the global business and the global brands. But let's see a bit something about the global brand, because we are very global. But look, there is not a single passenger airline in the top 100 of the interbrand global brand equity survive. You know what are the names? Great names. Kleenex, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Campbell Soup, and some other that are quite more relevant for the industry alongside Google, GE, and IBM. Why? Because national ownership restrictions of the bilateral system have restricted airline development in profitable global brands. The Campbell Soup participates directly in 120 country markets. Google in 160 and IBM in 170. But even our biggest airlines, United or Delta, serves only 65 countries directly. Airlines, what do we need? We don't want subsidies, we don't want money. We just want the normal commercial freedom to completely profitable as a global business in a globalized world, to run this as a normal industry. Fly where the market is and take our responsibility. China and India will surely recognize that the system designed in 1945 is not fitting anymore the purpose of this millennium. And I have to think that the only way forward is to wait until China has settled and wait for those changes. Because the only leadership that I see is in that part of the world. The other fund is the choice for the United States and Europe is to lead change and change policy or be left behind. I have not completely lost hope in the US policy agenda, dominated as you have seen with many micromanagement issues and very often paralyzed by politics. The global approach of Secretary Napolitano on security is refreshing and effective. A New York City understands the impact of terrorism and the need for effective aviation security. And this year will mark a decade since the September 11 tragedy. We had recently the example of the Nigerian underwear bomber, the famous Yemen printer cartridges, and remind us that security is a constant challenge. Together with safety, it has to be our number one priority. But it's a constant challenge for governments and industry. I spent my first years in IATA discussing with GSS that was completely close to the international community through industry expertise or to offer help. My conversation with the previous two Secretary of Homeland Security, we decide you implement. And I was trying to explain that if we implement something in the airports or in the plane, we have to be involved. We have a great experience in working with regulators on safety, and we made this the safest mode of transportation because this strong, cohesive approach it was not possible to achieve something similar in security. When Secretary Napolitano arrived, took immediately a completely different approach, engaging the industry at home and globally. And I see now two priorities for security. The first is to make the system convenient for the passenger, take away the hassle that everybody has when has to board a plane. And at the same time, try to be more effective at finding terrorists. Each, what happened, every security crisis has resulted in new rules and added another layer of the process. It's a bureaucratic process. It's another paper. 
what is needed is, first of all, an overall review of what has been created. A few months ago, in fact, last year, IATA started to work very extensively in this. And I propose to completely rethink the process and develop a so-called checkpoint of the future. Every time that I start an idea, I have a lot of experts that say, this is a crazy idea, it will not work. But at the beginning, I was a bit frustrated when it was for simplifying the business. You have to change 60 legislation, it cannot fly. But we made it. We made it after when it was an environment. And we will make it also now with this checkpoint of the future. The check process of today was designed 40 years ago to stop hijackers carrying metal. metal. Today, everybody is equally challenged to prove themselves innocent. My vision is for the checkpoint of the future that combines new technology. Because the stuff that you see at the airport, most of it is old. is old, built 25 or 30 years ago. Combine the technology and the intelligence to end the one-size-fits-all approach. Passengers will walk through a tunnel of technology with appropriate risk level identified by a background screening without stopping, stripping, and unpacking. You see it here. Just that is the self-service. You go there, you present your fingerprint, your boarding pass, and so on. The information goes to the airlines and gives a risk assessment. What is the information of the airline? Have you paid cash? Does your itinerary make sense? Are you a strange passenger? The same, in the same moment, the information on the passenger goes to the security agency. The security agent checks your record. And after, you have three tunnels in front of you. Red, yeah, depends on the level of risk. And you go and you walk, carrying your bag. Ladies, you don't have to unfold everything. You just go walking slowly and everything is checked. You go, it's impossible, it's crazy. We are nearly there. Because this kind of check is already existing, but you have to stay four seconds in the box. Now we have to improve the technology in order that you can walk slowly through the process, and we solve the problem. Because, and Secretary Napolitano now is strongly supporting this, and TSA, Administrator Pistol, so we are on board. We have to understand that we will have, in a couple of years, 3 billion passengers. If we don't have something like this, the queues will arrive into the parking lot. So this is something very important. And we are working not just with Homeland Security, it plays a very important part, but also with IKEA, and through IKEA with 19 governments, in order to design and test this kind of, uh, and we will have a first mark of this at our AGM in uh, Singapore. But we're full on board because also the innovative ideas of Secretary Napolitano about the checkpoint for the future and what the administrator, uh, Mr. Pistol, is working on is perfectly aligned on those kinds of models. So I applaud them for working on those initiatives. IATA has already set a certain uh, level of screening principle that has been circulated among a certain number of governments, and the uh, US is fully on board also this. And cost is another priority, because this must be addressed. Because the cost, what the airlines are spending today, airlines or passengers, depend on different countries, is $7.4 billion. And this is a 25% increase from a previous estimate. But the worst, it's an increase of money, but on an increase of level of service. We have the same stuff, old stuff, and we're paying more. The bulk of the increase is for increased data collection, air marshals, capital expenses, and things like this. And these should not be airlines cost, because aviation security is a national issue. That should be a government responsibility. Just very few governments around the world have accepted this principle. I don't know why, like secure security in public parks, on subway, in hockey arena, and football stadium is a government responsibility. In the airport, it's up to us or to the passengers. Government must bear the cost. And we hope that we can play a different role in having this kind of technology. 
as a final remark, has been, as you've seen, an incredible decade that has changed everything, airlines and government included, with two years of profitability, also have its week, 16 billion last year, $8 billion this year if the situation doesn't get worse, we are starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel, at least a black figure. The US industry is emerging into this new reality with some improving competitiveness, handling effectively capacity. But that, that kind of competitiveness has to be earned and improved every day. The old Pan Am building is a great reminder of the need of constant change. We cannot stop. We have to move fast and faster. And at the end of my time with Sayata, this is an opportunity. It's very special for me because New York is something special for me. And the many friends that I have in the room are something very important for me. It's an opportunity to thank the industry. And yes, even governments for their support in navigating through this incredible, difficult 10 years. At my last AGM, which will be in Singapore in June, I will present the results of Vision 2050. How did it happen, this Vision 2050, for probably some of you and for my young colleagues of the university? Last year, we were making, for the first time, we made a profit, 16 billion. And so some of our members say, Giovanni, we have to make a party. I said, look. I'm coming from a bank. I studied at the Harvard Business School. If we make a party for a 2% margin, people say, that's impossible. We are lost, really lost. Let's do something different. Instead of making a big party, let's think ahead. Let's think of what this industry has to do in order to become sustainable and profitable. So let's really ahead. Let's look ahead until 2050. And in order to do that, we asked 35 strategic thinkers the most impressive people in, in the world in aviation, including Minister Bento, Lee Kuan Yew, who you know is the founder of Singapore and is the strongest advocate for this industry. We worked, we presented a paper as IATA. We want to have another strong support. And we asked Professor Michael Porter to add his competitive expertise and look ahead for four decades. I was there at the Harvard Business School with Michael Porter in the 70s. And after that, he was involved in the first uh, two months we were having, I went to see him a couple of times, and we had a video conference every two weeks. He said, Giovanni, this industry for me is new. But I can tell you, in all my career, I've never seen a mess like this. <laughs> so I said, at least this is some good thing. We can say that we are not only stupid, but it's really a mess. <laughs> and I hope this uh, Vision 2050 that we will present at the AGM will motivate airlines, partners, and especially government to make those changes this, in the, this industry absolutely needs. And this is particularly important for traditional leaders as the United States that have played such a big role in defining our history and our future and our past. The US must bring its expertise to help to shape the future with a balance in forward-looking big picture on the policy agenda. Forget the micromanagement. Look ahead. Look big. And it is the responsibility of everybody involved in this fascinating and crazy industry to give it support. To give it support in order to turn into a normal business that is even safer, greener, and more profitable. Thank you very much. Oh. Giovanni, thank you so much for such a wonderful uh, talk and, uh, and mostly for your remarkable vision and industry leadership. Giovanni uh, has graced us with some time for some questions, so if you'd uh, have a question for Giovanni, if you'd please stand up and uh, identify yourself and ask your question, please. How many members will we lose? I have no answer on how many members will we lose, but our job as an association is to help all our members. You know, we don't have just... American Airlines and Lufthansa, we have Air Corio, Air Zimbabwe, Air Mongolia, Miata, many, many small. And so our, our objective was, let's help them. Give them three years. Let's help them with financial resources and consulting. Give a target, but who's not on board is out. And we had to terminate 26 airlines. The biggest thing that is not solved is security. It's security because you see that in the airports around the world, especially Europe and United States, it's a hassle. 
And it's a hassle that is impacted in two points. One, because our passenger is a customer and he's not pleased. And we have to improve the level of security. And that's the reason why this kind of tunnel or other initiative like this can try to regain credibility from our passenger. Because look, if you look uh, in a very honest and transparent way, what is the valuable proposition of this industry in the last 15 years? No other industry has reduced its cost and its price as we. Tickets are sold sometimes in incredible. So pricing are great. Level of safety, you saw. I always say it's much more dangerous to take a shower than to take a plane. <laughs> and the numbers tell the story. Two numbers. When IATA started in 1946, we had 9 million, 9 million passengers, and we had, uh, at that time, roughly 300 fatalities. Last year, we had 2.4 billion passengers and 600 fatalities. There's no other industry in the world. So if we are able to do this, I think so it's a great opportunity in order to make the passenger experience more pleasant, and that will be a positive issue because we need our passengers on board to support our industry. Because if no, we have all those regulations of micromanaging that is just hurting an industry and it's not solving our problems. But you know, on the question that you said on infrastructure, it's really a big, big problem. Look, in the last 10 years, in the last 10 years, there were just very few airports built. And uh, in Europe, just two, Munich and Berlin. In the States, a couple. Last year in China, 20 airports, more than 20 million here. And look also a country, an important country in aviation with a great history, UK. It's UK, it's 20 years that they are discussing, not an airport, a runway, the third runway at Heathrow. And I was a bit, uh, I hoped that the new government could have a different kind of approach. And I had several discussions with the new secretary, Mr. Hammond. And I told him, in a very honest way, I'll be relocating in London, so I have to keep a good relation with the government, and so I want to be nice. But let me be very honest. I would say, UK has lost completely its manufacturing. They don't produce anything, so loud. It's, the basic is the services, the financial services of the city of New York, of, of uh, London. Many of those services are being relocated. The hedge, well, four or five of the largest hedging companies are in Switzerland. The oil trading are moving from there. And that community is the community that needs an airport. You know that Heathrow Airport is the biggest international airport, has lost in the last year, in the last five years, 28% of these destinations. It's shrinking. It's connecting less the world. In this situation, what are you doing? And I say, you've got a great example because as soon as the government took place, you saw what, what are effective cuts in the budget. And the British was quite polite in accepting this without a big mess. I said, but what can you do? Why can't you do something on, on, the, on, the run, on the runway? Giovanni, this is, we cannot handle this. I said, why? I would say that politicians need to show leadership and I was giving him also an option to make it more easy. Look, and I'm involved because I'm in the board of NATS, Air Traffic Control of UK. And I can guarantee you, if you build a new runway, third runway, we will be absolutely convinced that there is no increase in CO2. You can give us a limit, because we will stop having a tour of London every time that a plane arrives. <laughs> and sometimes it's not a good tour because there's, there's fog or you don't see. And and we will be able to accommodate at least 30% more without impacting this. This is what you need leadership, because when you have something, there's no leadership. Unfortunately, the problem of Europe, and I'm speaking as a European, Europe is a mess, because we don't have any more leadership. And you see it, not just in this case of the airport, but you see it also in the volcano, a mess. And that is one of the, re and the problem also in the United States. It's a problem of this part of the world. You see China, you see another in the Middle East. Dubai has an airport of roughly 80 million passengers are building another one. And it's up to government to explain the importance of aviation, 
to take care of the environmental process, but to do that, you need leadership. And unfortunately, we don't see a lot of this kind of material around. Giovanni, again, thank you very much. Just a wonderful, uh, a wonderful speech, and thank you so much for entertaining our questions. As a, as a tribute to you coming, we have this small token that uh, reads, presented to Giovanni Bisignani in grateful appreciation for your presentation to the Aviation Leader Series of the Wings Club, New York City, March 2011. Giovanni, thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Thank you.